Hello, everyone. My name is Professor Lauren Chang from National Central University in Taiwan. I'm a professor in our Department of Space Science and Engineering. Today, I'm he here to talk about our work in developing small satellite design, development, testing, and operations capability here at NCU. This talk involves two of our first small spacecraft, IdeaSat and InspireSat-1, which we've developed in-house as well as in partnership with our colleagues abroad. So first of all, in terms of the barriers to developing your own satellite. So currently there are over 4,084 satellites active in Earth orbit. And the number of satellites that have been launched each year has been increasing uh, dramatically with time, both due to the uh, proliferation of massive con uh, low Earth orbit constellations such as Starlink and OneWeb, as well as the growing importance and utilization of small satellites, which are cheaper and uh, more rapid to develop and replace. So exactly what constitutes a small satellite? Well, according to the US Federal Aviation Administration, you can get a better idea of how the uh, space community has traditionally viewed spacecraft sizes. Spacecraft are typically classified based upon their mass. According to the FAA, a small satellite is in the category of 600 to 1,200 kilograms. So in other words, traditionally speaking, your spacecraft could be over 1.2 metric ton, could be up to 1.2 metric tons and still be considered to be a small satellite. An example of the small satellite in this definition is for MOSAT-2, Taiwan's second self-developed satellite, which uh, weighs 768 kilograms. Spacecraft can become even heavier. For example, a medium satellite by this scale is 1.2 to 2.5 metric tons, such as the NOAA-19 weather satellite, while an intermediate satellite is considered to be 2.5 uh, metric tons to 4.2 metric tons. And this can include large geostationary uh, satellites, such as the Himawari-8 um, weather satellite, which is 3.5 tons. You can imagine that for spacecraft of this size, they can contain lots and lots of redundant components, many times a very high grade, space grade, space qualified components, which allow for the spacecraft to be very stable and also operate for very long periods of time with high reliability. However, of course, the downsides of this is that since launch costs are measured based on the mass of the spacecraft, large satellites can cost a lot to, um, to uh, launch. And also, based on the number of components and the amount of redundancy, the uh, development costs and timeframes are also extremely long. Typically, a satellite of this scale could have a development time of five, up of five years, if not longer. On the other hand, in recent years, there's been a trend towards reducing this, uh, the mass of uh, satellites to, uh, to uh, values below about uh, 200 uh, kilometer, uh, kilograms. So for example, the recently launched Formosat 7 constellation was comprised of six mini satellites, which each had masses of 300 kilograms each. The Formosat 3 constellation, which was launched in 2006, was comprised of six microsatellites with masses of 62 kilograms each. And over the last two decades, one revolutionary uh, development in the uh, satellite business has been the development and proliferation of nanosatellites of masses between one to 10 kilograms and even Pico satellites and Fomento satellites with masses that are uh, even smaller than uh, one kilogram. So naturally small satellites have some shortcomings compared to large satellites. They can't carry as many redundant parts. In many cases, the uh, grade of the components used are not space grade, but rather industrial grade, or even some cases commercial grade, leading to shorter lifespans. However, on the flip side, they're much cheaper to launch, faster to develop, and also to uh, revise. So this has led to a major change in the development of thinking in terms of satellite development, as well as greatly reducing the barriers to institutions who make use of satellite platforms. So another mass, uh, very re, uh, major development in lowering the cost axis of space has been standardization. And in terms of standardization, one example we can look at in another industry in international shipping was the development of the shipping container in the 1950s. So before the development of, ship, of a shipping container, if you wanted to move freight onto or off of some type of vehicle, such as a ship or a uh, truck, then you had to move a lot of different uh, objects of various sizes and weights leading to uh, requiring long periods of time and also uh, uh, very, uh, lots and lots of human labor. 
However, with the development of shipping containers, which come in standardized sizes, as well as standardized interfaces to their carriers, all of the uh, above aforementioned um, uh, types of freight of different sizes could be enclosed into a standardized shipping container, which could then be very easily moved on board or off of various um, uh, shipping vehicles, and in many cases stacked to maximize the amount of cargo that could be, could be carried. So the development of shipping containers greatly reduced the cost and time required to ship items around the world across various modes of transportation. The same can be said for satellites. So in 1999, it was proposed by two professors at Stanford University and Cal Poly San Luis Obispo to develop small, uh, small satellites of standardized sizes and interfaces that could be used for science and engineering education to allow students the opportunity to design and develop their own uh, small satellites. So the standard interface and uh, format was proposed to, uh, to be uh, cubes of volume 10, centi of 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, each of which is called a unit. Each spacecraft has four guide rails, which serve as the main interface between the uh, spacecraft and a standardized deployment container, which is then attached to a launch vehicle for a larger spacecraft. In this way, these small spacecraft, or CubeSats as they are referred to, can be launched in a rideshare manner alongside larger satellites, thereby greatly reducing the launch, uh, the launch cost, allowing organizations that were previously unable to access space on their own, such as universities or even small to medium companies, to develop their own spacecraft. So the CubeSat design uh, form factor and the CubeSat design specifications have greatly reduced the barrier to space, as well as the concept of spacecraft ride shares in general. So starting from about uh, five to 10 years ago here at National Central University, we recognized the importance of uh, small satellites and their potential to serve as platforms for scientific instruments. Here at NCU, we've had a long history uh, in the development of scientific instruments to measure and uh, observe the Earth's upper atmosphere and ionosphere. Um, aboard various satellites and sounding rocket platforms. One of our first and most successful uh, spacecraft payloads was the Advanced Ionospheric Probe, or AIP. This was an in-situ plasma instrument that was uh, carried into space aboard the Formosat 5 um, satellite that was launched in 2015. So AIP allows us to measure various parameters of the ionosphere, which are important for understanding how ionospheric space weather varies and affects the propagation and absorption of signals used for satellite navigation, communications, and also over the horizon terrestrial communication. Again, being able to measure the ionosphere, which is the ionized portion of the Earth's upper atmosphere, also allows us to better understand the interface between the Earth's system and near-Earth space. So AIP was launched successfully on Formosat 5 and therefore has what we refer to as flight heritage. It was launched and it functioned successfully, returning scientific data. However, we realized at the time that in order to increase the number of observations available, we couldn't rely solely on large satellites such as Formosat 5. So we came up with a miniaturized version of AIP that we call CIP, the Compact Ionospheric Probe. So CIP it has a mass of 0.47 kilograms and a volume of 0.72 U, that is 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 7.2 centimeters. Its power requirements are substantially lower compared to uh, AIP or larger payloads, although it does require very uh, sp uh, high levels of pointing control as well as pointing knowledge. We need to know which direction the uh, instrument is oriented and also uh, how accurately it is, or um, and also uh, be able to uh, control its pointing to a high degree of accuracy. So CIP was uh, developed for use aboard small satellites and the development of CIP also led us to begin to examine opportunities for including CIP aboard small satellites, uh, aboard small satellite missions. In fact, it also served as the main impetus for us to begin to pursue the capacity to develop an entire small satellite here at NCU, which we previously hadn't done before. In fact, this led to the development of our first self-developed um, small satellite what we, which we call IDEASAT, the Ionospheric Dynamics Explorer and Attitude Subsystem Satellite. So prior to this, as I mentioned, at NCU, we had never developed an entire small satellite on our own, even though we'd worked on developing and qualifying small satellite and sounding rocket payloads. So in 2015, we had the opportunity to uh, join with colleagues 
abroad at uh, various international institutions with spaceflight experience or interested in developing spaceflight experience, we established an international consortium that we called INSPIRE, the International Satellite Program in Research and Engineering in 2015. So the main objectives of INSPIRE are to develop a constellation of small satellites for science missions and also a supporting ground network that could be used for tracking, telemetry, and control. At the same time, we wanted to use the development of these small satellite missions funded by different funding agencies from around the world um, for, from the uh, different member universities to pro provide the students with an opportunity for hands-on uh, experience in terms of mission formulation, spacecraft engineering, design, testing, operations, and also science data analysis. So this consortium started in 2015 with three members, us here at National Central University in Taiwan, the University of Colorado at Boulder in the USA, and also the Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology in India. Later on, um, we had additional members join, and as of now, we currently have, um, we currently have uh, 11 members located around the world, each contributing different types of expertise or resources. Every year, at least up to the beginning of the pandemic, we would send our students to the University of Colorado at Boulder for a summer internship program where they would work jointly on the design and testing work for the various uh, small satellite missions operating under the INSPIRE flagship. So thanks to uh, the INSPIRE consortium, we were able to include CIP aboard two small satellite missions. First of all was INSPIRE Sat-1, which kicked off in 2017. This was a 9U small satellite that was developed jointly between the University of Colorado, Indian Institute of Space Science Technology, and ourselves. We each work, worked to contribute our own knowledge and expertise in terms of payloads, subsystem designs, and also, of course, providing launch and uh, grounds uh, and ground uh, tracking and communications uh, capability. The second spacecraft that was uh, that carried CIP that uh, that kicked off in 2000, also in 2017, was IdeaSat, which was the, essentially the second small satellite funded under the Inspire consortium. Now, IdeaSat was developed entirely in-house here um, at NCU, but with input and technology sharing between different Inspire member universities. So the immediate benefits of, ha of being able to include instruments aboard small satellites is apparent in terms of being able to greatly expand the number of observations we have available using uh, AIP and CIP type instruments. So for MOSAT-5 is in a 720 kilometer, 98.3 uh, degree inclination sun synchronous orbit. However, the instrument, it, the AIP instrument itself is only active um, on the eclipse side around, that is around 10.30 uh, PM at night and in the mid to low latitudes. The inclusion of both InspireSat-1 and IdeaSat allows us to expand our number of observations to 500 kilometers altitude and also to uh, different local times, which is important when trying to understand um, the local time variability of the ionosphere. So InspireSat-1 um, is currently active. It was launched um, on uh, Valentine's Day of this year, whereas IdeaSat was launched um, January 24th of last year and uh, after functioning for some period of time, has since been decommissioned following the end of the six-month mission lifetime. So I'll, I'd like to start by talking a bit about IdeaSat, which was our first experience of in-house small satellite development and uh, operation. So IdeaSat is a 4.5 kilogram 3U CubeSat. That is, it has dimensions of 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 30 centimeters. The payload is, again, the compact ionospheric probe, which has to be oriented in the RAM direction of the spacecraft, that is, the direction of motion of the spacecraft when it is taking scientific measurements. Of course, CIP itself can't function alone um, uh, on orbit. It requires power. The data it produces needs to be stored somewhere and ultimately downlinked to the ground. So our spacecraft has an attitude determination control subsystem, which uh, integrates multiple different types of sensors, such as a star tracker and, of course, sun sensor and a magnetometer to allow us to determine the attitude of our spacecraft. At the same time, it includes various actuators that allow us to change the orientation of our spacecraft, such as three reaction wheels, as well as uh, magnet torquers. The data transmission is handled by our communication subsystem, which includes both UHF and S-band RF equipment. So we use the lower frequency UHF transceiver to receive commands from the ground and also to trans regularly transmit beacon signals that can be used to track the spacecraft and downlink flight data telling us about the state of health of the spacecraft. 
The spacecraft also includes a higher frequency S-band transmitter, which can be used to transmit the uh, larger volume science data back to the ground at higher data rates. The power requirements of the spacecraft are provided by our electrical power subsystem. This includes two deployable and one body mounted solar panels, as well as an internal uh, EPS controller board, which distributes uh, electricity to the different subsystems and also uh, includes a battery module that can be charged and powers our spacecraft when our spacecraft is in eclipse, that is when it's not in direct sunlight. Also inside the spacecraft and not shown here include uh, includes our command and data handling subsystem, which includes our onboard computer running flight software, as well as um, our thermal control subsystem, which includes various passive and active components to ensure that everything stays within its operational temperature range. The spacecraft structure itself was also designed in-house, and that ensures that our spacecraft is able to survive the extremely severe environments of uh, launch and also function properly on orbit. So this mission took uh, Took, uh, kicked off in 2017 and ran throughout 2020 and uh, was launched last January aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9. So in developing our first spacecraft, we first needed to consider which subsystems we would develop in-house and which subsystems we would purchase commercial off the shelf. So a guiding principle for us was to try and reduce risk and ensure that we could develop uh, deliver the spacecraft on time. So for subsystems that we believe that um, we could develop within a 10 year uh, time frame in house, we did so. This includes the uh, UHF deployable antenna used for uh, uh, use for communications, our electrical power subsystem and battery module, as well as our um, onboard computer and flight software and our spacecraft structure and thermal control subsystem. These were all designed by our students here at NCU and uh, fabricated and manufactured here. For other subsystems where we believed we would not be able to develop in-house uh, over the course of two years, we purchased commercial off-the-shelf components. This includes our ADCS, our, which is our attitude determination and control subsystem, as well as our uh, communication subsystem. Uh, in the case of our onboard computer, we used a commercial off-the-shelf system on chip as the core, uh, as our computational core. So one important gauge in determining the uh, risk level and also the maturity level of various types of space technology is what's called the technological readiness level or TRL. So for components or subsystems or software, that have flown successfully and successfully executed the mission, the TRL level is equal to TRL9, which indicates a very, very mature, highly reliable and trusted subsystem. In, on the other hand, a subsystem that hasn't actually been realized but has only been described on paper is basically at TRL1. So most of our self-developed subsystems started around TRL4, but now following the flight of Ideasat are either TRL9 or TRL8. The commercial off-the-shelf components we purchased, we ensured were all TRL-9 to reduce risk. Now, operating a spacecraft, designing and operating a spacecraft poses many challenges not present during the flight of other um, aerial vehicles, such as, say, aircraft or uh, UAVs. One very important constraint on a spacecraft in low Earth orbit, that is altitudes below 2,000 kilometers, is the fact that spacecraft are, are uh, traveling at very, very uh, fast velocities, so on the order of seven to eight kilometers per second. And due to their relatively close distance to the Earth, at least compared to spacecraft in higher orbits like geostationary orbit, the, the field of view of each spacecraft is relatively small. So we have a very, very short communication window with our spacecraft each day. Generally speaking, in the case of uh, most low Earth orbiting spacecraft here in Taiwan, we generally only see them once or twice, uh, around twice per day, and for no more than about 10 minutes each. So we have a very, very short time span uh, to actually contact the spacecraft, determine its operational state, and uplink commands if necessary. So our spacecraft has to be capable of autonomous operation without our direct intervention, and also autonomous recovery from any anomalies that may occur on orbit. Another major challenge with satellites is the fact that they have they require a very long operational duration. By operational duration, what we mean is the period of time during which this uh, platform cannot experience any major anomalies that would require external intervention. Um, uh, so on, in the case of, say, a guided missile, the operational duration would be on the order of minutes. In the case of aircraft, on the order of hours. But in the case of satellites, even a small satellite like Ideasat, the operational duration would be measured from months to years. So this requires a high level of reliability and also, again, capability for autonomous recovery from different types of anomalies. So to facilitate the autonomous operation of Ideasat, 
we first had to design uh, the operational modes of our uh, spacecraft and then implement that in the flight software that is executed by the onboard computer. So our spacecraft has two major types of uh, operational modes. Under nominal conditions, the spacecraft typically transitions between two different modes, science mode in eclipse and charging mode on the sunlit side. So you can see from this table here that the operational state of the different subsystems of the spacecraft vary depending upon which operational mode that we're in. If we're in eclipse and our battery state of charge is above a certain threshold level, that is um, above 85%, then our spacecraft will, will uh, transition to science mode. In science mode, our ADCS will be in local velocity, local horizon, LVLH mode, and orient CIP in the RAM direction of the spacecraft. CIP is turned on and takes scientific measurements. Once we transition to the daylight side, the spacecraft turns off the, pay, the CIP payload and then transitions to a sun pointing mode to charge to maximize char, uh, battery charging. The important part of this is to ensure that our average power uh, consumption is less than our average power generated, thereby ensuring that we have a power surplus and we are able to fully recharge our batteries. In the event our spacecraft encounters some type of anomalous operation or the battery charge drops below a certain threshold, in this case 60%, our spacecraft enters emergency mode. In the event of um, an emergency mode transition, our spacecraft first transitions to what we call safe mode. In safe mode, the spacecraft does not take any measurements and does not perform any actions beyond the bare actions required for survival. The ADCS is set only to sun point mode to ensure that the spacecraft batteries can max uh, can can uh, recharge as quickly as possible. You can see here that the power surplus in safe mode is considerably higher than it is during nominal operations. We also have what's called a Phoenix mode, which the spacecraft enters in the event of extremely low state of charge or when the spacecraft first separates from the launch vehicle. When our spacecraft first separates from the launch vehicle, according to launch provider requirements, our spacecraft cannot perform any, any uh, active op um, actions um, within uh, 30 minutes of separation to prevent interference with other spacecraft being deployed or with the launch vehicle. So in this state, the ADCS is turned off and the spacecraft is tumbling. You can see the power margin here is much lower. So Phoenix mode is really not a mode we want to get into unless absolutely necessary, so, for example, during deployment. So our flight software implements this concept of operations to allow our spacecraft to transition between these different modes on orbit and take protective actions to recover autonomously if necessary. So the development of IdeaSat took place over the course of three years. The first year was devoted primarily to definition of the mission concept, as well as defining the system level requirements and specifications that the spacecraft would have to meet in order to execute the mission. This is followed by the design stage, which took place from 2017 through 2019, where we came up with and uh, validated various different designs for the different spacecraft subsystems to ensure that they met the requirements we defined uh, previously. We also identified in the case of the commercial off the shelf components, the uh, COTS components that we wanted to purchase and proceeded uh, uh, to begin the purchasing procedure. Finally, in 2019, our self-developed designs were mature enough to the point where we believe that um, they could meet uh, the flight model requirements. And again, we also began receiving the commercial off the shelf components that we had purchased. We began integrating our spacecraft where we discovered certain problems that uh, did not that were not immediately apparent until the spacecraft was integrated. So this required some additional time and one of the major lessons learned from this was that hardware de development and debugging is much like doing the same for software, except each iteration, each hardware iteration requires more time and money to implement, fabricate, and then test. And certain bugs are only apparent when you have the actual hardware being tested and integrated in person. So a lesson learned from this is to begin hardware development and integration as early as possible during um, the uh, project cycle. So once we finished integrating our flight model in August 2020, we immediately moved to the testing phase. Here we needed to perform functional testing to ensure the spacecraft was capable of uh, performing the major functions it would need to function autonomously on orbit, such as power generation, deployment, communications, and uh, autonomous operation. And we also had to perform environmental testing to ensure their spacecraft could survive the environments of the uh, launch as well as the uh, thermal vacuum environments on orbit. So we performed a variety of environmental tests, including thermal vacuum, vibration, and shock. And at the same time, we performed several functional tests, most notably 
the end-to-end -end test where we hauled the spacecraft to the top of the nearby mountain about 40 kilometers away to verify that we could, could communicate both ways with the spacecraft. We were able to deliver our spacecraft just a few days before the final delivery deadline on November 27th, um, 2020. So we found a lesson learned from this uh, experience was that although the test and uh, the integration and test period is the most critical period for any spacecraft, you can see that in this case, we only had three months to complete this, which again shows that the importance of proper planning and time man management to ensure that we have enough time to uh, to uh, test to the uh, level that we're comfortable with. So we delivered our spacecraft to the launch the uh, to the launch provider on uh, November 27th, and there our spacecraft was integrate was placed into uh, the deployment module. The deployment mo the deployment module was uh, shipped to uh, Cape Canaveral, where it was then integrated with the Falcon 9 launch vehicle in December 2020. And finally, our spacecraft launched on January 24th, 2021. You can see here a picture from our launch party um, during the uh, night of the launch. And one thing, of course, we learned was that launch parties are great because if there's one thing that happens with launches, they tend to be delayed a lot. So that means you get to have multiple parties. So four hours after the launch of our spacecraft, an amateur radio station in Germany received the first beacon packet that our spacecraft uh, was tra uh, transmitting every 30 seconds to downlink flight data and to allow us to know their spacecraft is alive. Based on that first downlink beacon packet, that demonstrated to us that the spacecraft had survived launch, had separated successfully from the launch vehicle, and had powered on successfully into uh, safe mode. We also found that our spacecraft was successfully engaged in three-axis attitude control, and the state of charge of our battery was very healthy at 95.28%. The currents, temperatures, and voltages of all of our subsystems were within expectations, which demonstrated, again, that our students ha had demonstrated very good workmanship, and our spacecraft, at least uh, for now, was functioning in a stable state, and we could begin the comm commissioning process. So in the days that followed, we were able to track our spacecraft using our ground station, as well as various other amateur radio ground stations and Inspire ground stations around the world. We had some initial anomalies where initially we were unable to receive the beacon signals from our spacecraft due to the fact that our ground state, that unbeknownst to us, our ground station, which had been on the roof for over five years, had degraded to the point where it was no longer sensitive enough to receive signals um, on orbit. After some emergency overhauls, we were able to uh, correct this anomaly. And we also experienced some initial difficulty in trying to uplink commands to our spacecraft. After we discovered a problem in our amplifier setup, this problem too was also corrected. So we accumulated, so over the uh, first month of operation, we accumulated over 700 counts of flight data at our ground station that allowed us to evaluate the performance of our spacecraft design. So first of all, in terms of thermal performance, this plot here gives you an idea of how well our thermal analysis and design uh, performed um, on orbit. So here, you can see uh, the green bars correspond to the operational temperature range, the acceptable operational temperature range of different uh, components aboard our spacecraft, the battery, the solar panels, the UHF trans, uh, transceiver, the electrical power subsystem, and the command and data hand handling subsystem. The turquoise bars show the uh, temperature ranges that were measured during thermal vacuum testing, as well as predicted using thermal analysis software on the ground. And finally, the blue bars correspond to the actual temperature ranges observed in orbit. You can see that on orbit, the on orbit temperatures are all within the operational limit, which indicates uh, that our thermal analysis and uh, control design was quite successful. We noticed that, however, that um, of course, that our solar panels, which which were exposed, or which were directly exposed, experienced the largest temperature range. This was expected. However, we also noticed that our body-mounted solar panel PV0 um, was significantly hotter than our deployable solar panels PV1 and PV2. Initially, we were concerned that this might be indicative that our body, our deployable panels, had not deployed fully and were therefore not directly pointed at the sun. However, following some additional thermal simulation on the ground, we determined that deployment was likely successful and the difference in temperature range was likely due to different locations of the temperature sensors on the uh, deployable panels versus the body mounted panel. However, we did notice in the weeks uh, that followed certain anomalies on orbit that we were not expecting. For example, we noticed that even without uplinking commands to our spacecraft, 
our spacecraft would sometimes change operational modes or flight software parameters without our direct intervention. We noticed a few days after launch that the format of the beacon packets that we were sending suddenly changed from the original default short packets to long packets, which had a higher bit error rate due to their longer uh, size. Now, we believe that since normally a tr such a transition is only possible based on command, since we hadn't actually transmitted any commands at that point, we believe that this change in flight software settings was due to a radiation-based anomaly that is a single event upset. In a single event upset, an ionizing radiation particle causes a bit flip in onboard memory, which can change the uh, behavior of, uh, of uh, onboard flight software, or in extreme cases, cause flight software to hang. In this case, we believe that um, that a single event upset basically changed the settings of the variable controlling the type of packet being uh, beaconed. And this, in the future, this will have to be corrected by implementing error correction and detection encoding um, on our on onboard flight software to ensure that the flight software variables that our, uh, our flight software is reading is, are actually correct and not altered by SEUs. So our spacecraft operated in a very stable state for nearly a month following launch and uh, was in a very stable safe mode with very healthy power margins. The battery power was almost always over 90%. Our spacecraft was in stable three axis attitude control and um, we were consistently returning flight data that allowed us to monitor the spacecraft, um, uh, the spacecraft state. We had some anomalies that we suspected, including the single event upset that I just mentioned, as well as the partial solar panel deployment, which we were able to exclude based off of thermal modeling. However, we experienced a major anomaly on uh, on February 15th, that is about three weeks following launch, where we suddenly lost contact with our spacecraft. Our UHF transceiver su suddenly stopped beaconing, and none of the ground stations that were previously able to receive beacon packets from our spacecraft were able to do so, indicating that the problem obviously lay on the spacecraft end. We tried transmitting the reset command to the spacecraft multiple times, but there was no response. However, suddenly, on uh, April 2nd, which as it turns out was Easter weekend of 2020, our spacecraft suddenly began beaconing again. We reestablished contact with the spacecraft from our ground station the next day and successfully uplink commands, commanding the spacecraft to replay saved flight data. And the flight data that was replayed gave us some very important clues on what the cause of this communications blackout uh, might have been. The first clue was that this initial state of charge of our spacecraft battery was much lower than it ha had ever been during the previous stage of operation, which indicated that some type of deep discharge event had occurred. Next, we noticed that the counters in our flight data, including the number of commands received, the, uh, the command reject count, as well as the subsystem re uh, reboot count, had all been reset to zero, indicating that the spacecraft had been power cycled. However, in our flight data, there was no there was no record of any reboot being commanded by the uh, flight software or by the protective watchdog circuits, indicating that this reset was not triggered by any of our protective or autonomous recovery uh, mechanisms. Finally, we found that based on the number of beacon packets that we downlinked, the spacecraft had actually not been recording beacon uh, beacons uh, during the blackout period, which it normally should have been doing every 30 seconds. This was most likely due to the command and data handling subsystem not being powered on during this entire time. In fact, the evidence suggested that the entire spacecraft was powered off during this time. So the beaconing stopped again a couple of days later, but the data that we received pointed to uh, provide us with enough information to isolate the cause of this fault. So we found that a very likely explanation for this major blackout was a flaw in the autonomous recovery capability of our EPS. So our EPS has a reset circuit that allows the uh, CNDH to power cycle the spacecraft in the event of an anomaly or a watchdog timeout. Now, key components of this uh, reset circuit is a uh, Schmidt, uh, is a uh, Schmidt uh, trigger inverter, which is this device over here. This is a CMOS IC, and ICs manufactured during using the CMOS process are susceptible to what's called a single event latch-up in the event of an energetic particle strike. In the event of a single event latch-up, portions of the uh, IC that normally should not be conducting suddenly do. The IC enters a low impedance state and essentially is basically shorted out and, and stops functioning. If our, uh, if this, uh, if this uh, trigger inverter experiences a single event latch up, then essentially our entire spacecraft would be powered down. Now, normally to autonomously recover from a single event latch up, the action that has to be taken is 
this IC has to be disconnected from our power source, to, and which will allow the single event latch up to clear. However, a flaw in the design of this circuit is that after deployment, this IC is directly connected to our battery. In other words, unless the battery discharges enough by its own to the point where it can't sustain the latch up, the latch up will continue and the spacecraft will continue to remain in a powered down state, which is consistent with the apparent deep discharge of our battery that we found in our flight data, as well as the fact that our spacecraft was powered off during this entire time. Now, although single event latch ups can be uh, recovered based on a uh, power cycle, if the latch up persists for too long, the increased joule heating due to the low impedance state can in fact lead to irreversible damage and a shortened lifetime of the IC, which again can explain why the, we uh, lost contact with the spacecraft again a few days later. So initially, we hadn't considered this uh, possibility. We considered the fact of radiation primarily in the context of total ionizing dose. However, single event effects are much more like Russian roulette in that they have a, a certain probability of occurring with each energetic particle strike. So for future emissions, we need to consider single event latch up uh, recovery mechanisms, both for the individual subsystems, which we did, but also for components and circuits within the EPS itself. So the results from our first uh, space experience with space flight was that our design was capable of surviving uh, launch and also functioning well in the on orbit environment. However, the uh, recovery mechanisms from certain radiation anomalies, such as single vent latch ups, need to be improved, and we are modifying our designs to account for this. We also need to uh, be cap uh, We also need to uh, modify our testing procedure to be capable of detecting anomalies that will not appear unless until the spacecraft ex operates for an extended period on orbit. In other words, we need to fit, uh, to better define what type of burn-in testing we perform. So our self-developed avionics are now flight tested and in the range of TRL eight through TRL nine. And our ground station has been demonstrated to be capable of two-way communications. And we're currently working to improve the robustness of our self-developed avionics. And we finally held a decommissioning review for Ideasat September of last year to review the uh, successes and failures of this particular mission to ensure that the heritage from this mission can be carried on to improve the reliability of our future missions. Now, during this time, following uh, during the Ideasat mission and following, we also performed several major changes to uh, to our ground station and also to uh, the design of InspireSat One, based on both our flight experience from Ideasat and also from the shared experience of our international Inspire colleagues. In the case of our ground station, we refurbished all of our parts, allowing the sensitivity of our space of our ground station to be restored. We also implemented automatic RF switching capability that would allow us to rapidly switch between transmit and receive modes in the event of a uh, command uplink. Previous to, previous to this, in order to uplink commands, we'd actually have to hot swap the RF cables, which was not very efficient. In the case of InspireSat-1, several other changes to the spacecraft design were made to improve spacecraft survivability and autonomous recovery. For example, improved radiation shielding was implemented on more sensitive components um, on InspireSat-1. You can see stainless steel shielding applied to key ICs and also the SD cards used for uh, non-volatile memory storage aboard InspireSat-1. Um, based on our the experience of our colleagues in Colorado, the spacecraft flight software also had several mechanisms to ensure autonomous recovery. For example, a command loss timer implemented in InspireSat-1 flight software will power cycle the spacecraft if a command from the ground is not received within some given period of time, during which uh, in the event this situation occurs, it's assumed that some type of so flight software or subsystem anomalies occurred that can be cleared using a power cycle. This has proven to be useful several times. So InspireSat-1 was launched on uh, January, on, sorry, February 14th of this year aboard an ISRO PSLV um, uh, uh, mission, you can see a picture of InspireSat-1 being attached to the payload fairing of the PSLV C-52 uh, launch vehicle. So the uh, spacecraft was so the spacecraft was launched on the morning of uh, January 14th. You can see the launch of the spacecraft taking place over here, and in the bottom plot, you can see the payload fairing being released. The large geo satellite first separating from the launch vehicle, which is followed by the deployment of um, InspireSat-1. And you can see the deployment of InspireSat-1 over here, considerably faster. 
So again, this launch took place during the early morning Taiwan time. So this is our breakfast launch party. And thanks to, uh, in large part to the experience from Ideasat, this time establishing communication with InspireSat1 was, consider was much, much smoother compared to during Ideasat. We were able to acquire the spacecraft beacon signals the first time the spacecraft passed overhead. Again, we verified the spacecraft was in had booted into safe mode and was in a stable state of operation. Over in, the, in the weeks that followed, um, we were able to verify various other functionalities of the spacecraft. We were able to receive tracking beacons from the spacecraft, accumulating a large volume of flight data. We were also able to successfully uplink commands to the spacecraft, commanding the replay of, say, flight data or science data. We, uh, again, have been able to uh, 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 build up a ground system, which is, uh, which is able to uplink commands with relatively high levels of success. And the uh, science payloads aboard the spacecraft, both um, CIP as well as DAX, the dual aperture uh, solar, uh, the dual aperture uh, X-ray solar spectrometer provided by the University of Colorado, have been powered up, and in the case of DAX, have begun science uh, observations. So the mission, so it's been two plus two months since the launch of InspireSat One, and thanks to everyone's combined experience as well as lessons learned from InspireSat One, our spacecraft is alive, producing science data and uh, our students are getting hands-on experience on flight control. And so we look forward to continuing the mission and to uh, continuing to receive science data and continue to uh, track and validate uh, the uh, performance of uh, this spacecraft design joint, uh, jointly designed by students from our three universities. So InspireSat-1 and IdeaSat are our first two spacecraft, which are again, both, both launched this year and last year and have provided a, a wealth of hands-on um, flight experience and also development experience that have been that have allowed us to greatly expand our know-how and capacity in terms of small satellite design and operations, which can serve as an important tool for education as well as future science and tech demo missions. In the coming years, we have three more small satellite missions, being uh, where NCU is the uh, primary institution, iLight, which is a revised version of our three-use uh, small satellite design, which we hope to uh, complete this year by the end of this year. Pearl, which is a tech demo mission that we're developing here at NCU, and CyanX, which is a 12-use uh, small satellite mission, which would, uh, will be both a tech demo and also uh, provide information for heliophysics and also qualify a uh, hyperspectral imager developed at our university. We're also working with our international colleagues led by Nanyang Technological University in Singapore on Arcade, which is a very low Earth orbit mission, which will again provide in situ ionospheric observations and also um, remote sensing observations, allow us, allowing us to measure atmospheric temperature profiles and also qualify an, Im uh, an imager for application at very, in very, from very low Earth orbit, which are altitudes below 400 kilometers. So we're continuing our work on small sp spacecraft development here at NCU, and we hope through this to continue to uh, both provide our students with hands-on training and also further improve the maturity of our self-developed systems and components, which can eventually be spun off to industry for uh, long-term stability, uh, production, and also commercialization. So based on our missions so far, we've learned a lot. Some of the key lessons learned is that in many cases, while analysis is very important, many bugs and faults are more easily detected and identified after we actually have a physical uh, component or device to test. So rapid design fabrication and testing, as well as revisions of self-developed subsystems are important during uh, the development uh, phase of any small satellite mission and should be commenced as early as possible. In the case of, uh, of uh, some uh, of the subsystems that we worked on, we didn't actually have any in-house expertise. And so although we were able to devise solutions, they were neither efficient nor in industry accepted. So in many cases, in the event we, you run into a situation where you don't have the in-house expertise, it's best to go and uh, seek it out. And you'll likely get a much more reliable solution in that particular uh, with outside assistance. It's also important to document and discuss the lessons learned during the development process and actual op uh, an actual operational period. So this ensures that um, the know-how and the experiences, both positive and negative, that you gain from mission can be retained and to imp improve the reliability of future missions. And again, flight data, whether it demonstrates positive or negative outcomes, is very valuable since it would not have it could not have been obtained unless the spacecraft were actually on orbit where you can experience 
way more combinations of various anomalies or conditions than you could ever test for on the ground. So it's very important that flight data is analyzed, retained, and used to improve the design of future spacecraft. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have remotely. Thank you very much.